Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We'd love to have you. Going to start uh, the fifth and final book as the books of Moses relate to the Psalms. Uh, that, of course, being the Deuteronomy book of Moses. Psalm 107 through 150 uh, the subject we're going to see over and over uh, repeated and, and should become quite familiar to you by the time we uh, get through with Psalm 150 concerning the Word of God and, and that the Word of God is the only good. Uh, the counsels of God we're going to be studying concerning uh, His Word, showing that all blessings for man, which was the subject of Book 1, the Genesis book, uh, for book two, excuse me, that being for the nation of Israel in the Exodus book, book two, all blessings for the sanctuary are subject in the third book of Moses, the Leviticus book, and the one we just completed, the fourth book, all blessings concerning the earth and the nations are bound up with living the word of God. Disobedience to the word of God, on the other hand, has been uh, the problem of man, if you will, uh, the dispersion of the nation of Israel was brought on by disobedience of the Word of God. The ruin of the sanctuary also brought about by the uh, disobedience to the Word of God and the troubles that earth itself, nature itself, if you will, uh, encounters due to man's disobedience to the Word of God. Blessing, we're going to find out, is, come, is to come from that word being written in the minds of men and on the hearts of men, as Paul would write in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. The subject of Psalm 107, uh, we could think of it as the, the delivering and healing living word. And, of course, when we talk about the living word, you hear us sign off most every program here at the chapel that Jesus is the living word. And so no problem with you thinking that. In fact, you'll see, I'll point it out to you as we work our way through Psalm 107. Uh, Fifteen of the, uh, what would it be, 43 psalms in this, uh, the final Deuteronomy book of psalms are psalms written by David. Uh, we'll find one written by Solomon. Uh, the remainder, as the first, are anonymous. Uh, when we get to the, the Psalms in the later teens, uh, they're called the Psalms of Degrees. And uh, I'll point out to you then that I believe many of those were written uh, by one of David's descendants, that being uh, King Hezekiah, one of the more uh, righteous kings of Judah. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Let's go with Psalm 107, verse 1, and it reads, O give thanks unto the Lord, that's Yahweh, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, His loving kindness endureth forever. You know, we don't have a God of hate. I hope you're not taught uh, that we have a God of hate, that, that he just spends his whole day looking for someone to zap in the lake of fire or, or someone to fry like a piece of bacon. Uh, he's a loving God. Uh, we learn his will in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that, that, that it states there that he is long-suffering. That means that, that he's patient and he is patient with us. Uh, we try him often over and over and over, but he does have a lot of patience. But it goes on to say there in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that he's not willing that any of his children should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. That's his will. That's what he wants. You know, and he loves you. He may, may not love what you're doing, but he is always there to forgive. And, and you know, we're none of us worthy uh, of his grace, but that's the beauty of his loving kindness. Even though that we don't uh, deserve it, you hear us call it unmerited favor. None of us deserve it, uh, but he's still there to forgive. His mercy endureth forever. Verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them say so what? Let them say thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The hand always symbolic of the power of the enemy. Gaal is the Hebrew word for redeemed here. It's one of uh, basically two Hebrew words that you find in the Old Testament. This particular redeemed in the Hebrew language means by purchase. And, and how did, did our father purchase our redemption? It was very precious. It was the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that redeems us. Who's our enemy? Of course, well, I hope you know our enemy is Satan, the devil. And I'm afraid all too often, uh, Christians, we allow ourselves to be divided. We even have denominations, which that simply means divisions. And, and I'm afraid sometimes we get so caught up in, in bad-mouthing each other at the expense of our brothers and sisters in Christ that we forget who the real enemy is. Our enemy is Satan, and you know, he, he knows as well as anyone that a house divided falls, and as Christ would teach in the New Testament. And he would love nothing more for us uh, as Christians to be so busy uh, bickering and fighting amongst ourselves that we forget about him. Verse 3, And gathered them, this referring to Israel, out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And many scholars believe this is uh, talking about gathering Israel back to uh, Israel after the, the two uh, captivities, the ten northern tribes to the Assyrian and, of course, Judah, uh, that captivity to the king of Babylon. I don't believe so. Uh, because when Israel, or I should better say Judah, returned, as is written in Ezra in the books of Nehemiah, when Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, allowed Judah to return and, and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. But that was just part of Israel. I think this refers to something much even in the future, and that is the final uh, gathering of all of Israel back. You see, the ten northern tribes, when they left uh, the, the captivity to the Assyrian, they didn't return to uh, the land of Israel. They went north into across the Caucasus Mountains, and therefore they became known as the Caucasian uh, peoples of the earth, uh, settling in Europe, uh, later the United States, and even Canada. From the south, many of you with uh, reference Bibles, you have a uh, reference to your center column that that in the Hebrew is from the sea, the south being synonymous with the sea, uh, with those who were in Israel is what that's talking about. Verse 4, they, this being Israel, wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, a, a trackless waste, you could think of this. They found no city to dwell in. And this is referring to that generation who was judged to, to die in the wilderness because of their unbelief in God. They didn't trust God. They wanted to appoint a captain to lead them back into bondage in Egypt. But still, God did not forsake the, even that lost generation. Uh, he continued to lead them uh, through the wilderness, a cloud by day, protecting them from the, the terrible sun in the desert and a pillar of fire by night, uh, adding comfort and protection. Verse 5, Hungry and thirsty, 
their soul fainted in them, and the flesh is weak. But, and, and you know that again, God did not forsake this generation. He, he continued to feed them uh, manna from heaven. Uh, when the manna wasn't good enough and they complained, he, he gave them meat, the quail uh, that they desired. When they had no water, he opened up the rock at Mara and Meribah uh, and, and gave the people rivers of water to drink. I like this, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted. Now, I didn't say that their flesh, and certainly uh, their flesh bodies required uh, sustenance and water as they made their way across the wilderness, but uh, I couldn't help but think about the, the, the hunger and thirst of their soul. And this is the hunger and thirst of Amos uh, chapter 8, verse 11, where we learn that the famine of the end times is not for, for, for food or for bread or water, but it's for hearing the word of God. And you know, that famine is on right now. Uh, this ministry is just swamped with people who are literally starving to death for the Word of God. And I'm going to ask you to think as we work our way through this psalm, not, not to just think physically, but, but try and think spiritually and physically as well. Verse 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Israel would soon move into the promised land. The, the younger uh, people is what I'm saying there, those who were less than 20 years old when God made the judgment that they would die in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb would, would enter the promised land. And prophetically, even though this points to today, you see, there's a promised land that's in our future. It's called the kingdom of God. And are we going to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors uh, that we might believe our Heavenly Father and trust His Word? Uh, I, I hope that we can. I know many of you uh, trust in His Word and, and already you, you seek to have His Word written in your mind and on your heart. You wouldn't be watching this program if you didn't seek that. Verse 7, And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. His way always ends up right. And how do we know what, what is his way? That's the subject of this, the Deuteronomy book is his word. The fact is, uh, in, in the, the, the very name Deuteronomy, it, as it's translated from the Hebrew, is Elehat Debarim. And it means, and it's, as the book of Deuteronomy starts out, these are the words. We're talking about the word of God. Verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness or his kindness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. Not only give him thanks, but also witness to others what God has done for you. And you know, when you have his word written on your heart and, and in your mind, you should want to share that with your brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. As Christ would teach in the New Testament that you know we shouldn't, uh, you don't light a candle, which is symbolic of, of truth or light, if you will, that dispels darkness. But you don't light a candle and then put it under a bushel basket or, or under a bed. You set it on a candlestick that your light may shine forth to glorify God. All too often, and I like this, that, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works. You know, all too often I'm afraid that the only time God hears from some of his children is like in verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Don't be one of those that the only time that God hears from you is when you are in trouble. Don't forget to thank him. It makes his day. Blessings will always follow. Verse 9. 
for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. This is quoted in Luke chapter 1, verse 53. Uh, soon after Mary, the mother of Jesus, learned that she was with child, with Jesus, uh, she quoted this verse, uh, magnifying the Lord. And you know, he will satisfy the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul. Again, think spiritual here. He feeds us very well from his word. And you know, that's what a pastor should do, is prepare the pasture for the flock, for the children of God. Are you willing, though, to make a few minutes a day to, to study his word? And I know, again, many of you are because you're still watching this program. But if you're willing to seek him, God will fill your hungry soul. Verse 10, Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction or oppression and iron. And iron's put for uh, chains or, or you could think of them like handcuffs, uh, fetters made of iron. And you know, your religion shouldn't put you in bondage or captivity. As Jesus would teach in John chapter 8, know the truth and the truth will set you free. If your religion binds you, I'm afraid you're in the wrong church. You need to find one that teaches you to be free. And when I say free, I'm talking about free from the problems of this world. Because if you are a mature Christian and you're free, you have your priorities on a different level than people of the world do. You know what's really important is building up your treasures in heaven, uh, not accumulating a lot of wealth here on earth. But as he sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, Psalm 23, verse 4, the resurrection psalm, it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. And many people believe that that Psalm 23 is uh, concerning death, when actually the subject is resurrection. It doesn't say I'm going to go sit down in the valley of death and die. It says there in, in Psalm 23, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No stopping uh, going right on through. Why? Because Jesus Christ gave us the victory over death, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 52, and the following verses, that, that Jesus defeated death, and, and therefore, uh, death, where is thy sting, grave, where is thy victory? Verse 12, let's do 11. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned, this word means scorned, the counsel of the Most High. Most High is Elyon in the Hebrew as possessor of heaven and earth. And if you want trouble in your life, friend, rebel against the word of God. We see it time and time again, example after example of the problems that men encounter when they rebel against the Word of God. If you want blessings in your life, uh, study His Word to where you know the right way. Do the best you can to do things right, which is according to His Word, and receive His blessings. Verse 12, Therefore He brought down their heart with labor, these are who rebelled against Him. They fell down and there was none to help. There was no sign of a helper. And you know, God will humble his children. We see that throughout the time of the judges of Israel. Time and time again, God would let them go into oppression to their enemies. But then the people would learn, to, well, they'd go down to the bottom of the ladder and finally would look up to their father and ask him, and he would hear their cry, and he would send a judge to deliver Israel. And always remember, God will never chastise his children 
unless he loves them. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 6 and the following verses. He only chastises those that he loves. So when he chastises you, kiss the paddle, uh, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and get on with your life serving him. Verse 13, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble over and over again. Here we go again. And he saved them out of their distresses. And you know, at this point, I don't care what you have done. Uh, there's nothing that you could have done that's so terrible that God can't and won't forgive you if you turn to him with a truly repentant heart. Now, that's not to say that that offer uh, continues on forever. You see, there comes a day when it is too late. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 tells us about those ten virgins that some of them had sufficient oil in their lamp, the oil always symbolic of truth. And when the bridegroom came, that's Jesus Christ, they went in to the, the wedding and the door was shut. The other five of the virgins had enough oil in their lamp. Uh, they went in town to buy the oil. Of course, you can't buy truth. But when they returned to the wedding, they knocked on the door and said, Lord, Lord, let us in. What did he say? He said, get out of my sight. I never knew you. But at this point, it is not too late for you to turn to your heavenly Father. Verse 14, he brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. God is capable of doing that. Again, truth dispels darkness, and your heavenly Father's word is truth. If you take time to learn it and learn the truth, as Jesus said in John chapter 8, the truth will make you free. It will break those bands that others try to place upon you. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. I think the psalmist is trying to make a point. That's the second time that he said that. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Your, your heavenly father is in charge. He is in control. He's able to do the same for you today. Uh, do you ever feel like you're in bondage to something? Uh, perhaps your work, uh, perhaps your financial situation has got you feeling like you're in bondage. Uh, God can break those bands asunder if you do things His way. Get into His Word. It changes lives. Verse 17, fools, and this you could can, can translate as perverse or or perverts, because of their transgression or because of their rebellion and because of their iniquities are afflicted. They bring affliction upon themselves. Why? Because they rebel against God. That's what we were talking about. Rebelling against, against God is what causes man problems. Verse 18, their soul, still referring to the fools, abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. They're killing themselves uh, spiritually, if you will. I had a thought here, but no one can say it better than Brother Paul. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5 concerning the fact that they abhor all manner of meat. Hebrews chapter 5, the teachings of Paul. Let's pick it up with verse 11. <clears throat> of whom we have many things to say. In other words, of Jesus Christ, we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered or, or difficult to explain, seeing you are dull of hearing. It is very difficult uh, to explain something to someone who is dull of hearing. This word dull, if you, it could be translated uh, lazy, as a matter of fact. And, and many people, unfortunately, today are too lazy to study God's Word and understand it. Verse 12, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, 
you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, the utterances of God. In other words, the basics, uh, salvation, for example, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And in other words, what Paul is saying here is you, you should have matured as Christians to the point that you are helping your brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. You should be teaching them God's Word, but you haven't moved on to the meat of God's Word. You're still caught up in the milk, in other words, the salvation message. Unfortunately, many of our brothers and sisters go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And you know, all they hear is a salvation message. And there's nothing wrong with salvation. Don't take me wrong. I'm not going there. Salvation is necessary. Salvation is a beautiful thing. But to sit there and teach the, the congregation salvation when they're already saved is not getting into the meat of God's Word. They abhor strong meat. Verse 13, For everyone that uses the milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Our subject in the Deuteronomy book of the Psalms, the word. For he is a babe. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. At the time they should, and when we say a babe, that doesn't say a specific number of years. We're just talking about immaturity in God's Word. And, and if you're only on milk, that's what you are in God's Word as far as your level of maturity. You are but a babe, an immature Christian. Verse 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, those who are mature. And again, that doesn't mean a specific number of years. I know six and seven year olds that are pretty mature in God's Word. Why? Because they've been taught. Uh, they're already into meat, not milk. Even those who by reason of use or practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, to discern or di differentiate between good and evil. And that's when you do things God's way. You know, and that, that is something that as you, as you mature becomes instinctive to you. You don't have to look at something for very long to know that it's right or wrong. You can differentiate between right and wrong, between good and evil when you are a mature Christian. Now back to Psalm 107, verse 19, reminding you our subject uh, the Word of God, and, and all blessings are bound up in living the Word of God. Not, not just hearing the Word of God, but, but living your life, uh, doing the best you can. And don't anybody get off on a guilt trip. We all fall short. We all mess up. That's the beauty of repentance. But uh, you must be a hearer and a doer of the Word as it's written in James chapter 1, verse 22. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourself, as it reads there in James. Verse 19, back in Psalm 107, Then they cry unto the Lord, we're back talking about the fools, in their trouble, and He saveth them out of their distresses. He won't let them down. I remind you, we're talking about the, the perverts, the fools here, who rebel against the Word of God. Even they, when they turn to Him in trouble, He hears them. Let me ask you, how much more do you think He hears you? And when we're talking about trouble, I uh, can't help but think about the day of Jacob's trouble. That's when Antichrist is here on earth. How much more do you think the Lord is going to hear you in that day of trouble? those of you who love and serve Him and, and know you have a destiny to help accomplish His plan. Verse 20, He sent His Word, the subject of the Deuteronomy book, and healed them and delivered them from their destructions, uh, from destructions such as their graves, in other words. 
And I asked you to think upon the living word as we began Psalm 107. Yes, the Lord sent his word in John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, that W-O-R-D there is logos in the Greek, and that is Jesus Christ. He sent his only begotten son and healed them. We're not talking about a physical healing, although he certainly has that power, but the main subject here is a healing of your soul, a redemption, if you will, to where the grave does not have the victory over you. All blessings are bound up in this, 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. That's the third time. I, I believe this psalmist has something that he wants us to understand. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing the sacrifice he wants today of course our love not our burnt offerings but he also wants us to share uh, to declare his works and with and with rejoicing and in the hebrew that's with singing if you will even to others let others know what god has done for you perhaps they'll wake up and and allow god to do the same thing for them they that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. We're going to see an analogy here of those who merchant men who go by ship uh, to conduct their business on the oceans. These, referring to the merchants, see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. You know, they may cuss like a sailor, but... Anyone who has been out to sea and has seen uh, the, the swells in the oceans, some 30, 40 feet straight up, and then some 30 or 40 feet straight down. The analogy is that we're going to learn here is that God, it's, that, that it's just like your life, that, that God can make it to where if you do things his way and do the best you can to follow his word, you can have smooth sailing through your life. Uh, if you choose to rebel against your heavenly Father and go against his word, uh, you can expect a lot of waves and, and rough sailing in your life. We'll come back and, and finish this Psalm 107 in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout uh, Puerto Rico, uh, the United States, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual uh, denomination or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others serves no purpose. We simply won't do it, especially when it comes to our uh, Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll let God's Word uh, do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. 
If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in uh, being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone or a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and again, I encourage you, don't let it be that your Heavenly Father only hears from you when you're in trouble. Uh, make time each day to go to Him. If it's true and you love Him, tell Him that you love Him. I don't think you have a lot of competition. It seems like we live in a particularly uh, evil generation, an evil world. You don't believe me? Uh, we'll just watch the evening news. Uh, we do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, illnesses, Father. Uh, problem marriages, Father, you know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. Uh, and we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, protect, touch, heal in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. First up today, we have Doris from Kentucky. And God bless you, your family, and your staff, and thanks for remembering our staff. We have a, a very hard-working uh, group of people here, and for uh, the number of folks that we have that work for the chapel and volunteer, it's an amazing uh, amount of work that gets done, and we appreciate them very much. Is it safe to say that people with two or more personalities have evil spirits or even legion in them? You know, it's possible, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that because not everyone, you know, there, there are people that have a mental disorder that's called multiple personality disorder. And it does not mean that they are possessed uh, by evil spirits. And, and how does one discern between one who is possessed uh, or one who has multiple personality disorder? It's called discernment, spiritual discernment. And, and as you mature as a Christian, uh, you're able to differentiate between the two. And uh, I don't know how to explain it other than that, but, but uh, that's been common practice for many, many centuries uh, for those of the religious community uh, to condemn anyone with a, a mental disorder or mental illness and saying that they're possessed with devil. When there's a, a distinct difference between someone who is uh, ill and someone who is possessed. Barbara in Wisconsin, who are the lost tribes and where are they today? Well, let's first say God didn't lose anyone. He, he knows exactly where all of his children are, but there's, there are some tribes that lost themselves. They don't have a clue who they are and it's the 10 tribes, the northern tribes, that went into the captivity to the Assyrian. And uh, when they came out of captivity, they went north over the Caucasus Mountains, uh, thus becoming the Caucasian peoples that settled into Europe and later the United States and Canada. We offer a book in our library called uh, Missing Links Discovered in the Assyrian Tablets, which historically documents uh, uh, where the lost tribes of Israel uh, went and where they are today. <clears throat> Hazel in Florida. I think I've finally got the sequence from church age into the tribulation other than I have heard some say the rapture. Uh, and then you say, which I have heard you say is not biblical is after the church age and before the tribulation begins. I think you said the church would be here at the time of Antichrist. Could you please clarify for me? And certainly I'd be happy to. And uh, the church will be here. The rapture, uh, look at history. The rapture was not even mentioned. Nowhere do you read of a rapture until after the year 1830 when this woman named Margaret 
uh, McDonald had what she described as a, an evil dream. And she woke up from that talking about rapture. And there were a couple of preachers there that said, aha, we don't have to teach the book of Revelation anymore. We're going to teach that there, everyone's going to be gone and thus the birth of the rapture theory. But it's false teaching. Uh, we're going to be here. The church will be here during the tribulation of Antichrist. Why else would the word teach us to put on the gospel armor of Ephesians chapter 6, that we can fight against powers and principalities on high. That includes Satan himself. And you sure don't want to forget that shield, the shield of faith, which quenches the fiery darts of Satan. Why would you need the gospel armor if you're going to fly away? It's not biblical. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, we learn that there are some who will overcome, and they're the ones who will have that gospel armor on, and they take part in the first resurrection. Uh, the rest of the people, the first resurrection means that the second death, the death of the soul, has no power over them. What does that mean? That means they're in the, the, the good to go into the eternity. But everyone else is dead, spiritually dead, until the end of the thousand years, the millennium, which is where the great white throne judgment occurs. Uh, at that point, you're judged either into the lake of fire or into the eternity, one of the two. Reuben in Texas. What scripture says when we die, we go to heaven? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from the body, the flesh body, is to be present with the Lord, the teachings of Paul. Uh, Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, we'll get it said. Uh, air, the silver cord parts, that's a Hebraism, a figure of speech that means when we die, that the flesh returns to the earth from which it came, and your spirit returns to the Father from whence it came. Jessica in West Virginia, when you sin, and after you've repented of your sins, is there still punishment that follows? No, not for uh, sins that you have been forgiven of. They're blotted out. It's like they're erased out of the book. And having said that, you know, there are laws, they're called the health laws, that if you break them, you're still going to pay for them because you're not going to be as healthy as you could be if you stayed, stayed with and obeyed God's health laws. But that does not affect your spiritual body. The great white throne judgment of, of Revelation chapter 20 is not going to be judging your flesh body. It's going to be judging your soul. Lily in Illinois, and you have seen, uh, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, here we go, Deuteronomy 29:17. And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Is it possible to make an idol of ourselves through arrogance, pride, and foolishness? Are we yet far from grace? Or do we just lack the sense of understanding and obedience? Well, anything... Lily, that, you know, and, and many today say, well, yeah, those bad people way back there in Bible times, they had idols, and they'd whittle a god out of a stick or out of a rock. But they act like we don't have idols now. We do have idols of this generation. Anything that comes between you and your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you've made an idol out of, out of it, whether it's a, a car or a boat or, or a motorcycle or your home, if, if it is more important to you than your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you've made an idol out of it. Therefore, I guess if you uh, consider yourself more important than your relationship with God, yes, you've made an idol out of yourself. Clayton in Arizona, since Satan was made the full pattern, did he impregnate Eve spiritually or did he physically lay with her? And the answer to that is in Genesis chapter 3, 
verses 16 and 17. And, and I'm going to go back further than that, Genesis chapter 2, along about verses 14, 15, 16. God told Adam and Eve, you can partake of any tree of the Garden of Eden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was the serpent. And Eve disobeyed. She lay with the serpent. And, and we can verify how he impregnated her in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. She conceived a child. And God said, I'm going to greatly multiply thy conception. So, uh, yes, the, in fact, in, in Genesis chapter 6, uh, we have the fallen angels, those who weren't born of woman, came to earth. And they were able to impregnate women. So, uh, the, the serpent is not the sole instance that that happened, is what my point. Velma from Georgia. Where is it in Jeremiah that tells he took the king's daughters to Egypt and later to Scotland? Or is this information found in history, not in the Bible? The latter, you're not going to find that the fact that Jeremiah uh, took the daughters of Zedekiah, the last uh, king of Judah before the Babylonian captivity. And in fact, historically, we, have, we offer a book here at the, in our library called Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. And Jeremiah was known in the British Isles as Olin Fala. And he took the daughters of Zedekiah first to Egypt. And that's uh, recorded historically. And then he did take them on to the British Isles. And you follow us concerning the parable of the fig tree. My husband and I studied with you many years. My husband died September 3rd of 2000. Death was a blessing to him as he was in uh, constant pain. He was of the fig tree generation, wasn't he? Question. I know I'm missing something according to verse 34. Shouldn't he still be here? Well, you know, God promised... Uh, Velma, that there would always be a remnant that would pass the truth down from generation to generation. And I, I always say that those who are not alive in the flesh when the Antichrist returns, which will be God's election who witness against him as they're delivered up uh, before the synagogue of Satan, but there are those that have passed on that were the remnant and were responsible for uh, passing the truth along. And you know also the Lord is building an army that will return with him in, in Revelation chapter 19. And many of our ancestors who have passed on uh, before the Antichrist is here on earth uh, are ready, locked, and loaded to return with Christ uh, when he returns at the second advent. We're sorry for your loss too, Velma. Uh, Jeff from Tennessee, do you recommend that new students of the Bible begin reading and studying with the book of Genesis and then proceed through the other books in order? Or is there some other better way that would allow for more understanding since I know that so many things in both the New Testament and the Old Testament connect with each other. God bless you and everyone at the chapel and thank you for that blessing and God bless you as well. Jeff, on page three of every newsletter, we have a list of suggested uh, tapes and studies for new students and uh, the books of the Bible that are recommended there. Uh, one, the first six chapters of Genesis, very important for you to understand what happened at the beginning You'll also find the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. If you don't know what happened at the beginning and you don't know what happens at the end, you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding everything that's going on in between. Uh, the book of Daniel, also important for you to understand. There are some single study tapes there too. So, and I always liken it to algebra. You got to get the basic building blocks down or else before you start building on your knowledge of God's Word, or else you might get 
30 feet off the ground and realize you forgot something on the, the foundation and it comes crashing down. So get the basics down with those individual studies listed there, suggested for new students, and then pray about it and go wherever God leads you in His Word. All of God's Word is, is suitable for our learning. David in Alabama, I watch you every day. I have learned so much. I ordered a large print Bible from you. I read it most every day. I smoked for 50 years. I just can't stop. Will the Lord help me not to take a cigarette from the Antichrist? Well, pray for strength to quit. Everyone, it's, it's just, you can't argue with the evidence that, that smoking is not healthy. And, you know, they've come out with several new things. And if you haven't checked with your doctor in recent years, ask your doctor, you know, about what's available now to help you quit smoking. And always remember to pray to God for strength to quit. And if you're, again, though, if you're unable to quit on your own uh, and with God's help, ask your doctor. There are some new things out that uh, uh, people are having success with. Pearl in Nevada, uh, let me get to your question. Is America mentioned in the Bible? If so, please explain. And uh, I like to think that Isaiah chapter 18 uh, is referring to the United States. It, it speaks there uh, of a nation that sends out ambassadors. And we have the United Nations uh, here. And, and it's a land that is spoiled or are divided by rivers, and certainly we, we are blessed with great rivers in this country. The, uh, the Mississippi, the Colorado, the Arkansas, the Missouri, on and on and on the list goes. But it's also a land of people who are, the men are tall and peeled, which means uh, clean-shaven for the most part. So uh, I believe that, make a note, Isaiah chapter 18 is talking about the United States of America in prophecy. Russell in Georgia, I have heard you numerous times refer to 2nd Esdras uh, chapter 7 verses 77 and the following verses and that often in reference to the gulf that you read about in the King James Version Bible in Luke chapter 16. It continues on, Russell does, my 1611 edition Apocrypha only goes to verse 70 in chapter 7. What's up? And I was speaking at, at church yesterday with a gentleman and he was asking me about the same thing, Second Esdras uh, chapter 7 verse 77 in the following verses uh, talks a great deal more than Luke 16 does about the bad side or the wrong side of the gulf. And when I say chapter 7 verse 77 I'm talking about in the good speed apocrypha that we offer here at the chapel. And I'm going to check out uh, before our next lesson and have an answer as far as whether the 1611 edition uh, for some reason does not have that or if perhaps there's a break there. But I'll have an answer for you in our next lesson. But I can tell you for certain the good speed apocrypha has Ez second Esdras chapter 7 and verse 77 and verses following. <clears throat> Linda in Colorado. Why is the number 40 so prevalent in the Bible? Uh, the great flood, <coughs> excuse me, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, the people in the wilderness, again 40 years. Jesus in the wilderness, uh, 40 days and 40 nights and any I may have missed. And there are a lot of other instances where 40 is symbolic of probation or a time of trial or testing. And that's what the number 40 is in biblical numerics. Jennifer in Missouri, I very much enjoy your program. I enjoy hearing from you all about the five living things in Revelation. Your words go directly to my spirit. Very inspirational every day. Thank you. And I'm not 
sure what you're talking about. I wish you'd given a specific scripture, Jennifer. I'm, I'm thinking you're probably talking about uh, the four beasts uh, of Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, which are directly related uh, with the four living creatures in Ezekiel chapter uh, 1, verse 5. Uh, those uh, beings were created by God to protect his throne, if you will. And that's when we see when his throne came to earth in the book of Ezekiel, the four living creatures uh, were there uh, protecting his throne. Cynthia and Colorado, can there still be a possibility that the Geber uh, are still here on earth? If not, can you explain why we have so many really tall people? Well, we have tall people, but none that compare uh, to Goliath, uh, the champion of Gath, whom uh, little David went up against in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You see, Goliath was about nine feet tall by the descriptions that we have of him uh, found in 1 Samuel. Uh, today we have a few, and I do mean a very few, uh, seven-footers, but none uh, are you going to find that go up above nine feet such as Goliath. Uh, it was the sword of Israel that God chose to destroy the Geber from the face of the earth uh, the second time. There's going to be a third influx, though. You need to know about it, and I'm out of time. I love you a great deal because... You enjoy studying Father's Word in depth. His Word is important to you. It's so important to you that you take time to study His Word. I assure you, blessings follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.